You are listening to One Nation Under Crime, a historical chronological true crime podcast. Each week, we go through our nation's history and discuss cases from each year starting in 1800. I'm Kayla. And I'm Leah. We've made it to October. October! Ghost-tober, as I like to call it. <laughs> uh, which, which now means Ghost-tober is on the Travel Channel. It has become so exciting. It has. Hulu has Huluween. I mean, it's clever. I won't deny it. I like Ghost Tober better. Anyway. I'm just letting you know. I just. <sighs> did you notice I'm wearing a Halloween shirt? I did notice that earlier. I did. I thought it would please you. I did. Leah brought me another Halloween goodie today. I did. So, um, a little painted cat uh, that is precious. Um, it's over a jack o' lantern. It is. My boyfriend will roll his eyes uh, when he sees it, much like he did with my little ghosts. And well, I made him aware that the little ghosts will be out year round. Well, he's an uncultured swine. But you know, it's okay. It's it is what it is. That's just how things he has, go. He has other qualities. I yes, that is true. Um, but. We are on episode 70. We have made it to 70 zero. episodes. That's how old my mama is. 70. Look at there. One for each year of her life. Look at there. And we have an interesting topic for our first topic. Murder. Of October. Well, yes. Which is bad. Which is bad. We've discussed. <laughs> but... You will see. This is a this is a bit of a, a callback to a previous episode. Oh, I love it when so, things circle back. You will because uh, we'll get into it. You'll you'll recall when I discussed this uh, previously. As long as it isn't Patty Cannon, I do not. Want to it go was back not to her. her. No, we will not be going back there. That is for sure. I don't like. Her. Um. So our sources for this week, all that's interesting dot com, where you can find things that are interesting. I would hope. I would think so, and then. Murder by Gaslight. I had to say it before you said it. <laughs> well, I mean, I never know because sometimes I'll say it and you'll tell I know. me, no, not this week. Not and this then week. I get sad. I do the pouty face. You can't see it, guys. I know. But I do, I do a pretty good pouty face. I'm pretty good I, at it. It's, uh, yeah, this is another Murder by Gaslight um, case. But it's actually way more famous Ooh. than uh, some people who were looking at the title of this episode are saying, I know that name Ooh. why do i know that name we'll get into it so we are in 1855 this week you're just trucking on i mean we're just getting through it let me tell you so our events in 1855 january 23rd the first bridge over the mississippi river opened in what is now minneapolis minnesota cool don't want to be the first person to go across that bridge also why not I just don't want to be the first person to go across the bridge that goes over the Mississippi. <laughs> My luck. Well. It will collapse. She's a witch. I mean, just Wait, saying. No. Like, <laughs> just saying. So, I, yeah. Uh, no, I'm good. And actually, so, <clears throat> yes, I was watching the Travel Channel the other day. Shocker. And remember. Planning your next vacation, I hope. Of course. Um, so, <laughs> you know. The Travel Channel, where all shows are all ghosty all the time. <laughs> it just, whatever. But uh, there was a show on about the White House. And the ghost there? Remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the president, uh, Franklin Pierce, that was nominated er, and he won. And like three months before he went into office they were in a terrible train wreck and his son died yes you remember? yeah so he didn't see him inaugurated but he knew that his dad won all i will say oh no is that played a part in the show that i was watching and let me just say that um we might have a special ghosty episode mm-hmm. and history and murder and crime coming up this month. Oh, because yeah. there's a lot of things that occur. As I was watching it, I was like, oh, my 
gosh, this is so scandalous. Like there were so many things that happened and like murder and crime. And so just, just a little bit of a teaser for coming up. Y'all will have a special little episode before Halloween to get you right in the, in the mood of, of all of the, um, goings on that have occurred. So presidential spookiness. Is yes. that what I'm hearing? Yes. Hmm. Some pretty heavy presidential spookiness. And what better time of the year than now? Than Halloween. And um, and it actually does tie to the year of that week that we will be discussing it in. So there's actually something that does occur in that year. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, leave it to me to tie something back. But it should be pretty cool. There's a lot of different interesting things that have, that have kind of happened. And we'll, um, I don't know if we've talked about it on the podcast before. I know you and I have talked about stone tape theory where people say that like buildings that they yes. can hold because yeah, of like, I think we have talked about so it. I, yeah. So that stone tape theory is also involved in the white house because it's all made of stone uh, and the type of stone that it's made of. Uh, so Interesting. Which was very intriguing to me and a lot of different things that occurred. So we'll get to talk about some people who frauded presidents who might have said that they were psychics and ended up not being. We'll discuss a lot of a lot of interesting things. Any any week. people who sang happy birthday to presidents? Happy Possibly. Birthday, you know, president. I mean, possibly. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I will, all week. I will say that that specific murder, there's a theory. There's always theories. Between him and Abraham Lincoln. Interesting. So, anyways. Oh, yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. There's a big theory. So we'll discuss a lot of different kind of things like that that are going to go on. And it'll be an interesting episode for sure. So I'm really, really excited to dig into that. <laughs> Just because like it's anyways, I like knowing different things about places like that, especially like creepy history. And they there's this whole theory that we've talked about how places like Native Americans once owned that land. And so now like the land that things are built on are supposed like it's bad luck. And that also has a lot to do with, um, with that as well as we've discussed the Hope Diamond and how the Hope Diamond lives in DC now. And the Hope Diamond is supposedly cursed and all the different things that come along with that. So there's, there's a lot that surrounds the White House that uh, not everything is as it seems. Um, We'll find out that Miss Lincoln was quite bougie. Um, <laughs> so we'll get there. But I just, just remembering the bridge, that that reminded me of it. So, and then also on January 28th, the first locomotive ran from the Atlantic Ocean to the, spe- to the specific Pacific Ocean. <laughs> specifically. Yeah. Specifically Which to the I Pacific. I put my toes in. You know. Um, very cold guys. and it was very on cold. the Panama Railway February 3rd the Wisconsin Supreme Court declared the U.S. Fugitive Slave Law unconstitutional Woo-hoo! which if we remember what the Fugitive Slave Law was that was if you were to you know capture someone who was a fugitive slave you were then or to meet them or to pass them or anything you were then required by law to quote take them back where they belong that was kind of like the implication, um, which is garbage. I think the verbiage was return them to their owner. Yeah. Yeah. Like a, like a dog, um, which is ugh, anyways. So then February 10th, the U.S. citizenship laws were amended and all children of U.S. parents born abroad were granted U.S. citizenship. Hmm. February 12th, Michigan State University was established. February 22nd, Pennsylvania State University was founded as the Farmers High School of Pennsylvania. Uh, Very University was a high school? Yes. It was uh, quite, quite intriguing. So March 3rd, possibly, possibly my favorite event to have occurred in quite a while. Okay. 
I'm ready. You're not ready, I promise. <laughs> March 3rd, the U.S. Congress appropriated $20,000 to create the U.S. Camel Corp. Oh. This was an experiment by the U.S. Army to use camels as pack animals in the southwestern United States. Cool. The camels proved to be hardy and well-suited to travel through the region, but the Army declined to adopt them for military use. The Civil War interfered with the experiment, and the animals were sold at auction. And I put, which begs the question, how much cooler would the Civil War have been with camels? <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> it would have been a slow war. Would have been a slow oh, one. Oh my goodness. Um, but that is all I could think of. Can I tell you the civil war with camels? Camels have beautiful eyelashes. They do. They do have nice eyelashes. They don't they don't they don't smell great. Well, I mean they're animals. But what animal does smell great? I don't know. That's that is that is true. Uh but yeah, so I, I would have liked, I want someone to make that a movie. <laughs> Civil War Camels. Return of the Camels. Camel Corps. <laughs> camel Corps. <laughs> I mean, there's camel lots, you know. I mean, <laughs> Camel Corps. Come on. Uh, March 8th, the first train crossed the first railway suspension bridge in Niagara Falls. Ooh. March 15th, Louisiana established the first health board this is a little bit heading too close to home in the recent years to regulate quarantine oh. yeah march 30th elections were held for the first kansas territory legislature missouri border ruffians crossed the border in large numbers to elect a pro-slavery body so um, if we remember so kansas nebraska act that's a whole thing. Like we we discussed that before, how Kansas brought that created bleeding Kansas and all these other different things. Well, so Kansas was then starting to put in legislature in place and people in Missouri wanted pro-slavery in Kansas because that would benefit them as well. So they were kind of like pushing in people from Missouri to Kansas to like inflate the voting numbers right. to get pro slavery. Come in on, place. people so, don't mess with elections. Yes, yeah, just not. Let's well, not. Uh, April of that year, tension between nativists and German American immigrants in Cincinnati breaks out into territorial street fighting on election day, leading to the Cincinnati riots of 1855. Ew. April 28th, the first veterinary college in the U.S. was incorporated. In Boston. Cool. Because uh, everything's Boston. Everything. Everything. <laughs> Boston or Philadelphia. <laughs> Those are the two places. June 6th, the Portland rum riot occurred when a crowd gathered at a storehouse believed to hold alcohol in Portland, Maine. The militia was called in and fired on the crowd to disperse, killing one person. All over some rum. Wow. Just Must have been some good rum. He didn't even get to drink any before he died. Oh. July 4th, Walt Whitman's poetry collection, Leaves of Grass, was published in Brooklyn. August 1st, the Castle Garden in New York City, now known as Castle Clinton, was opened as the first U.S. receiving station for immigrants. Hmm. August 6th, Bloody Monday, the day that was the day that the Protestant Mobs attacked Irish and German Catholics on Election Day in Louisville, Kentucky, occurred and caused 22 deaths. Ugh. November 1st, 31 people were killed in the Gasconade Bridge train disaster in Missouri. And you were wondering why I wouldn't want to go over a bridge. <laughs> Just saying. And then our undated event, which this will actually come back in this episode, interestingly enough. Our undated event in 1855, Samuel Colt incorporated his business as the Colt's Patent Firearms Manufacturing Company and opened a new factory called the Colt Armory in Hartford, Connecticut. Horace Smith and Daniel B. Wesson formed the Volcanic Repeating Arms Company in 
New England, Smith and Wesson. Both very near and dear to my husband's yes. heart. <laughs> Uh, and so Colt's going to come back in this episode, interestingly enough. So March 8th of 1855, William Poole, a.k.a. Bill the Butcher, died at his home in New York City after surviving for two weeks with a bullet lodged in his heart. Whoa. Yes. And we are back in a location that we discussed a mere 28 episodes ago, back in February. In episode 42, we talked about the 40 Thieves gang, and now we're back. And unless you were binge listening to our episodes, you might have forgotten a little bit about the specific area we are going to cover this week. And I know, I told y'all back then, I said... I I named this specific person we're talking about this week, and I said, this person is coming back, and we will discuss this person at length. Now we are here. 28 episodes later is all it took. Today's the day. We are in five points. So I'm going to review five points kind of just briefly again, because it is pretty uh, essential to our story this week. Um, If you remember at all, and I'm sure you may not, which is okay, but it was a neighborhood located in lower Manhattan. And for anyone who knows anything about Manhattan, it's like the north eastern and eastern point which is kind of Chinatown and the Civic Center area um, is where it is today. The area was extremely populated uh, to dangerous levels. It was described as disease-ridden, crime-infested, and it was noted as a slum. And it was called that for 70 years in New York City. The middle and upper class abandoned the area by the early 1820s, and poor immigrants started to flood into the area. The numbers soared in the 1840s when many Irish Catholics fled during the famine, which is where a lot of our case is going to come in today. At the height of its occupation, We discussed this previously, too. Only certain areas of London's East End vied with this. And if anybody knows anything about London's East End, if you're thinking Jack the Ripper, that is what we're talking about. Kind of like the really bad areas of town um, where there's a lot of disease, you know, there's a lot of death, unemployment, sex work, crime. A lot of those things are going on here at this time. Uh, A lot of people actually considered Five Points the original American melting pot, and it consisted primarily of freed slaves and Irish immigrants. Uh, There were tensions between the two communities, but it is actually considered the first large-scale instance of racial integration in American history, which is very odd to think about. It's interesting. It is is very interesting, but um, kind of... especially for it to be that time period, is is very interesting as well. So this was also a fun fact, fun e that I discussed uh, before. Uh, five points is alleged to have the highest murder rate of any slum at the time in the world. According to an old New York urban legend, the old brewery, which was um, formed uh, from the Collard's brewery from the 1790s it was an overcrowded tenement housing that housed around a thousand people so i'm sure those people that's not no that's for sure over capacity um it is said to have had a murder a night for 15 years until its demolition in 1852 so that was just three years before this case today. So all of the things that are occurring around this time in five points, all of these things are kind of, you know, ramping up everything that we're going to discuss today. Could you imagine that being your life? I mean, that's, that's terrifying. It is. It's really scary. And, and to think like you were not that far from the really nice areas of of New York City yeah. at the time. And and just like it, it's it is true where, you know, kind of a lot of the the thing about London and London's East End is that you could literally just take a turn down the wrong street and be in a completely different area. And that's a lot of what this kind of was then as well. So yeah. 
we um this area that we discussed before i told you that it was home to some infamous mobsters um al capone being one of them but two of them that i mentioned in our episode that we discussed this um are at the center of our case today one of them william pool aka bill the butcher the leader of the bowery boys and john morrissey leader of the dead rabbits gang dead rabbits yes i mean wow and we will find out that john morrissey's gang was created solely because of the bowery boys So we're going to talk about William Poole the most. Um, And we're going to call him Bill just because everything kind of just calls him Bill. A lot of sources don't even use his name, William. They'll just call him Bill Poole. Um, But his name is William Poole. Uh, He was born in Sussex County in New Jersey on July 24th of 1821, making him a Leo. There isn't much that we can gather from his early life, but in 1832, when Bill was just 11, his family moved to New York City and opened a butcher shop in the Washington Market, which is like where Tribeca is today. Bill worked by his father's side in the butcher shop and eventually took over the family shop from his father. Seems pretty fitting that later he would be known as Bill the Butcher, and this is partially the reason why he's called Bill the Butcher. (laughs) But not solely the he reason used he's these called Bill skills the Butcher. in other ways. I'm assuming not, not in the way that you would think. Like that's what I kind of thought too when I got into it, but not in that way. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I'm pleasantly surprised. You know, recently Dahmer just came out on Netflix, so I'm sure a lot of people were thinking that's probably the direction this is going. It has not. Um, and no, you will not watch it. Do not. Oh, no, don't. No, don't worry. I'm not, but. Yeah, uh, no. No, I, I did not. But I did send, send you a meme that I thought you would appreciate. Yes. And I got nothing on it. <laughs> uh, probably because I'm traumatized by that show at this moment. Like, trauma. You? Yes. Whoa. Trauma. It is. It's a lot. <laughs> it's. <laughs> I mean, I, I border on, I saw someone talking about it the other day. And um, they were saying, like, oh, you know, this is not like your typical thing. First of all, I'll go ahead since this has come out and a lot of people have seen it by now. First of all, 10 episodes, way too long. Way too long. Like I haven't finished it yet, but I'm in episode, I want to say five maybe, and it's way too long already. Like it should have been maybe six episodes. They could have done everything and wrapped it up in six. I think 10 is way too long and I'm, I know that some of his victims, like their family is very vocal about how they are not okay with it. Yeah. And they didn't get any, they didn't, they weren't asked before this was made. They didn't know anything about it. And one of the uh, women, her brother was a victim and they show, they reenact her Mm. speech in court. And she has said like, I, if you had not told me this was a doc, I would have thought that was me. Ugh. Like I, she, and it is very eerily. The actress looks the exact same that she does. Like it is very eerily similar. Um, I saw something that played the two played actually the real court film and the show side by side. It is very accurate. Oh my. But, she, you know, a lot of them were saying, like, this is, it, it feels exploitative, and it does well, in and some... And it's making you, making them relive yes. something that they have, you yes. know, hopefully... Tried to heal from. beyond. Yes. I mean, you, you can never forget it. No. But they have spent so many years healing from, and this is just kind of reopening. And she said, you know, she, she said, like, it, it, her brother who who was murdered um by him had kids and like they're they are living and Uh. so they were saying that it's just very difficult and and it is and i understand that and and there's a lot that's very specific to what was going on and i just think that you know 
one of the things that they said was we found out the same way everyone else found out when it came out in the media that this was being made. That's when we found out that this was being made. Like we, we weren't given, you know, any foresight into it. And I, I know we have a true crime podcast. I get that. Like I know true crime is a big, obviously it's a big, um, genre that a lot of people are I won't say it's their favorite I'll say they're very interested and fascinated with a lot of things and my boyfriend sat there the other night and he said like why are people we actually were watching something on Ted Kaczynski um the Unabomber last night and we were saying he said why are people fascinated with this and he said and I get it I'm watching it right now so I get he said but I find it interesting in the way that there's a lot behind Kaczynski that that deals with MK Ultra and the CIA and a lot of those kinds of things. And he said, you know, I think that's part of why I'm so interested in this, just because like that that's very fascinating to me. And he was like, but I don't there's so much around true crime. And, you know, and I kind of told him, I said, I think it's one of those things that a lot of people are scared of. And I said, it's kind of like scary movies. Like, why why are scary movies and horror movies someone's favorite genre? Because it's they something that you're mine. scared of. <laughs> and it's something that some people on some level, even though they're scared of it, they want to understand it in a, in a sense of to something make it less scary. Yeah, that you can't understand. And, you know, with women, there is very much a psychological thing that women are most likely to be victims of crime. Um, statistically speaking, so women are most likely to be a victim of a crime. And I think that a lot of, you know, it's kind of a, a protection thing for women. Where sure, it's what like, did she do wrong? What How it, can I do yeah, something what, differently? What, what can I learn from this? What can I know? And I also think that we're not trying to victim shame. No, not at all. It, it's it's a, it is, it's not a, vi- I'll say this. It's not a victim shaming thing at all. It is how was this person so manipulative or so good in a sense of what they did yes. that they were able to trick this very intelligent yes. person? What can I learn? Yes, to trick this person into thinking it was okay. Like Dirty John, we, everybody consumed Dirty John. Like it was no one, like everyone was fascinated by how this man could, you know, this woman was, um, you know, very, very, very successful in her job. And like, how did this man worm, worm his way into her life to, you know, try and destroy it. And she was a very intelligent woman and she met him on a dating site. And it's like how, you know, as we know, a lot of people know how that story ended up where her daughter actually ended up killing John because he attacked her outside of her apartment and it, the daughter, not even the woman. And there were all these terrible things. And it's, I think that a lot of times we, we do have a fascination with things that we don't understand in a way that we want to understand it more. But I think some things I will say, I think some things like this, like Dahmer, the show, there is a, a line that you shouldn't really cross. And I don't know where that line is. I am not a specific, I'm not a family member that, that, that specific event occurred to. I don't have that life experience, but I can see, yeah, I can see how that is very triggering, very traumatizing. And well, and not knowing about it until, hey, it's about to come out. Yeah. And and the actor who is in it, Evan Peters, holds a very dear place in my heart because he is. Did you ever watch Phil of the Future? Nope. Okay. If anybody out there knows Phil of the Future, yes, he was like the crazy, goofy friend in Phil of the Future. And he was also in like, but he's also been in American Horror Story and he's been in all of these great, he's a great actor. And he truly does kind of become the character that you can almost take away the fact that he's Evan Peters, like, and because he he does have a very like distinct face and just very, you know, who he is. And um, if you know him. And so I, I know that he very much was 
not wanting to be disrespectful of anything. And he has come out and said, you know, he doesn't, he really didn't want that to be kind of the, he didn't want it to be glorifying in that sense, but he does play Dahmer. Like he, he plays this person so well, it's chilling to watch. Like it, it, it truly is one of those. It is a Heath Ledger as the Joker. It is like so crazy good, like that it's scary. And, you know, we were talking about this just the other day, which we haven't talked about on the podcast yet. And like, I know this is going like way off on a tangent, but this mm-hmm. is something that's like, that is very important. I sent you everything the other day about Adnan Syed and how, you know, yeah. he's just been let out and that's so amazing. And, and I truly, you know, I truly do believe I can't say which this is very, I know a political way to say this. I cannot say he's innocent. I can say the state definitely did not have enough evidence to even take him to court. Um, and I don't believe personally that he had anything to do with it. I, I think after learning the things that we've learned, especially even now, there were other people that they ruled out that they shouldn't have. There, there's a lot, but even in the sense of that, like people are very happy for him that he's now home and he's not in jail anymore. And, and that is very great for him. But I put it on our Instagram. I, I did a post on our Instagram about it and, and I put on there, you know, for, Hey, the, the, the victim for Heyman Lee, like her family has spent all of these years trying to heal from this and it's just like the whole Dahmer situation where they've spent years trying to heal from this thinking that this was over and now and now it's starting all over again again. yeah and in one and in one area this is very different from Dahmer is that like I don't believe Adnan should have been in jail I don't I don't believe he should have been convicted there was no evidence there was no nothing it was all hearsay it 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 put him in court today with the same evidence. And I don't believe he would have, would have been convicted of anything. And, but still on the same hand, at least even as a family, you don't think that the ruling was right. Even as the family of the victim, it's a ruling. And, and, and you can solidify that in yourself of saying, I didn't make the decision that, that he was guilty a jury made the decision that he was guilty. Right. So in some sort of closure. Yeah. And, and now it's, it's back open again. And I mean, Dahmer's dead. He was murdered in prison. Like that's, he's gone. Yeah. But now these people are reliving this and it's just very, it's a lot. And I can see how the family members would be upset. And I think it was way too long. And I think there were a lot of things. And some people were like, oh, I couldn't even make it per- past the first five minutes. And I was like, okay, one, you can make it per- past the first five minutes. Like, you don't watch true crime, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> Two, people were like, oh, like, it was so, you know, fascinating or this or that. And I'm like, it was actually really slow. Like, <laughs> really slow. Like, that's why I said it could have been cut down. Whatever. I'm not Ryan Murphy. but who's created this, but, um, or one of the creators, but anyway, so all that to say, back to Bill the Butcher, not associated at all with Dahmer, (laughs) but (laughs) by the 1840s, Bill was actually a volunteer firefighter with, uh, the Howd Volunteer Fire Engine Company number 34 which was located on Hudson and Christopher Streets. This is where he started the Washington Street Gang that would eventually evolve into the Bowery Boys. During this period um, in New York, fires were a huge problem for the city. Volunteer fire groups such as the one that Bill was in were important to keeping the fires under control, right? Like volunteer firemen, fires, this is what we're here for. Not so simple. because. These firefighting groups were closely tied with street gangs, and they were seen as a public service provided by those groups. 
There were rivalries between the fire companies to put fires down in the neighborhood. One of the strategies that the Bowery Boys used to ensure that other fire engine companies could not put out the fires. Oh, so it's not about putting out fires. It's about who's the best at putting out fires. Who who did it? It's who put out the fire is their, oh, is their whole thing. Okay. So once hearing the alarm, a Bowery Boy would find the nearest fire hydrant to the fire and flip over an empty barrel over the fire hydrant and sit on the barrel so it could not be seen or used. The Bowery Boy would sit on the barrel until his own fire engine arrived. However, fights over the fire hydrant would break out, and sometimes the Bowery Boys had no time to actually extinguish the fire. Oh, my. So, at the cost of lives. Possibly, yes. Uh Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And the buildings, mm-hmm. it's all for pride. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. okay. Because if you were the one who put it out, you were seen as like the the better the, hero. the better of the groups. Oh. So each fire company was tied to a street gang. Boys are stupid. <laughs> so murder is bad. Boys are stupid. I'll get you another sweatshirt. Um, <laughs> so, so yes, uh, Bill himself as a person was described as quite a large presence of a man for this time. He was around six feet tall and weighed just over 200 pounds. So my boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, not only did this make him noticeable for a fireman, but it also made him well known in the under ground world of illegal boxing Ah. it was said quote he was well known as being a notoriously dirty fighter not adverse to biting off noses gouging out eyeballs and beating a man to jelly while boxing itself wasn't illegal at this time bill was a bare knuckle boxer which was illegal due to how brutal it was, which today we would just call like MMA fighting, but... Which I don't understand. Um, So uh, his background as a butcher also made him a skilled knife fighter. When Bill wasn't inside the ring, he was on the outside gambling and heavily drinking. In the 1850s, Bill was married and later had a son named Charles, but... In the 1850s, Bill also closed the family butcher shop and opened a drinking saloon and called it the Bank Exchange, which, all right, I have to give credit where credit is due. I love the name of a bar or mainly a bar that is clever. So there was a bar... um, in I want to say New York, maybe Boston, that was called the library. Mm-hmm. So you could say I'm going to the library, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it was so. He called his bar the Bank Exchange, which I just think is going to the bank. Very funny. Um, remember that I said before that Bill formed the Washington Street Gang, and they morphed into the Bowery Boys. Well, it wasn't uncommon at the time for gangs to change names because members were known to move from one gang to another, and then smaller gangs would kind of join other groups and become a much larger presence in the area. Kind of think of like Transformers, how they like <laughs> join together and create Robots something much larger. Disguise. Yeah, I mean, kind of like that. Um, As for the Bowery Boys, they were an amalgamation of the Washington Street Gang, the American Guards, the Atlantic Guards, the True Blue Americans, and the Order of the Star-Spangled Guard. Well, now. All of these groups shared a common thread. They were nativist, white, Anglo-Saxon Protestants who were very opposed to the growing number of Irish Catholic refugees coming to America as a result of the famine. The Bowery Boys Hmm. specifically were, quote, bound by ethnic ties or nativist beliefs. The members tend to be deeply patriotic, and a common thread was the belief that the country was pretty well full so that newcomers were not welcomed. 
These tensions were palpable and did not help that the Bowery boys were right on the border of the Five Points neighborhood, which, as we know, was the melting pot of all those who the Bowery boys despised, we'll say. Um, Here, there were freed slaves, Irish Catholics, Irish Americans, and German Americans. The Irish were the main focus of the Bowery Boys' torment. And as a result of this, the Irish created their own gang called the Dead Rabbits. Dead Rabbits. Yep. Quote, for years, the Bowery Boys and the Dead Rabbits waged a bitter feud, and a week seldom passed in which they did not come to blows, either along the Bowery or in the Five Points section. These street fights made Bill a well-known fighter outside of the ring just as much as he was in it, and it didn't take long for Bill to find other street gangs who were in agreement with his beliefs and alliances were formed. Another topic that we briefly discussed previously in that episode was Tammany Hall. And I mentioned that it was a bit confusing because Tammany Hall sounds like it should be a building, but Tammany Hall is actually a political organization. So it it is a bit confusing. Uh, Bill was completely opposed to Tammany Hall, but the main reason is 1,000% racist. Uh, Tammany Hall was accepted and included immigrants as members. And then they also had gangs who protected Irish Catholics from the Bowery Boys, just like Dead Rabbits. Um, Bill was also a member of the Know Nothings Party, which was referred to as the Native American Party or the American Party. Members were required to say, I know nothing, when anyone asked about specifics of where of like the group's activities, which is where the Know Nothing Party came from. Nice. Uh, The group was anti-Catholic and they were nativists, which nativists essentially means they didn't want immigrants coming into the U.S. and they only wanted people who were born in the U.S. But it's the 1850s and like, okay. Um, (laughs) Most of you are immigrants or you're, yeah, most Parents of you are first were, generation. Yeah, like most but, of you. Okay. All right. Whatever. Um, I was just like, oh, interesting. Uh, the goal was to organize native born white Anglo Saxon Protestants to defend and preserve their religion and control of American politics from enfranchised Catholics, Jews, immigrants, and their descendants. Bill was actually nominated by the Whig Party in April of 1848 as a member of the municipal court. He tied for last place. <laughs> but in February that of hurts. yeah, but in February of 1853, he was appointed to represent the 6th ward on the New York City Board of Education. It was a culmination of all of the things that made up Bill that led to the events which occurred at the Florence's Hotel. The New York Daily Times reported the following on October 23rd of 1851, and this is like an article from New York times which we know like new york daily times they're very um polarizing in their in their in their things so <clears throat> quote a brutal outrage in broadway it's the title if you can see splashed across the front yes, page yes 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 we learned that at an early hour yesterday morning two noted pugilists which pugilists were boxers entered florence's hotel corner of Broadway and Howard Street, and without any provocation, seized the barkeeper and beat his face to a jelly. It appears that Thomas Heyer, William Poole, and several others entered the above hotel, and while one of the party held Charles Owens, the barkeeper, by the hair of his head, another of the gang beat him in the face to such an extent that his left eye was completely ruined and the flesh of his cheek mangled in the most shocking manner. After thus accomplishing the heartless act, all of them made an effort to find Mr. John Florence, the proprietor of the hotel, with a view of serving him in the same manner, but not succeeding in their latter design, they found the hat of Mr. Florence and wantonly cut it into strips and trampled it under their feet. 
The desperados then left the house, and in the meantime, Mr. Owens was placed under medical attendance. And in the course of a short time, he proceeded to the Jefferson Market Police in company with Mr. Florence, where they made their affidavits respecting the inhuman outrage upon which Justice Blakely issued his warrants for hire, pool, and such of the others who were concerned in the affair. And the same were placed in the hands of Officer Baldwin for service. Since the above was written, we have been reliably informed that the affray originated from the fact of the barkeeper having refused them drinks after they had been furnished with them twice in succession. Well, the end. How dare he not give him more drinks? I mean, you know, it's per- perfectly stable for you to remove his eye, essentially. And, you know, it was, all right. I mean, that, that I is, just love how they couldn't find Mr. Florence, but they found his hat. So and cut it up. They, <laughs> cut it up. <laughs> we couldn't find the man, but we found his hat. <laughs> Therefore, his hat shall suffer. <laughs> we shall cut it into strips and trample upon it. <laughs> what? I mean, but, you know, a man's hat. I mean, think about it. We couldn't find Mr. Florence, but we found the hat of Mr. Florence. <laughs> but at that time, people, I mean, you know, you had as people had a specific kind of hat that they wore. And as, I mean... You know, I mean, I get it, but, deal, it's just, but it is kind of funny. <laughs> I just imagine them in the bar with the barkeeper. Behold, like, hat. and one of them just comes running out of the back room. I couldn't find Mr. Florence, but I found his hat. Will this work? <laughs> that will do. <laughs> Let us cut it up. <laughs> nice. Oh, gosh. So... <laughs> Bill had made a reputation for himself, making him infamous in town, much to the chagrin. Love that word. I you know that too. I put it in anywhere that I can. Much to the chagrin of his public enemy, John Old Smoke Morrissey. Old Smoke. Old Smoke. Well, there you go. Morrissey was the leader of the Dead Rabbits, which, if you remember, was created to protect the Irish Catholics from Bill and the Bowery Boys. The Dead Rabbits. I still don't understand. Why do they have to be dead? I don't know why. I didn't actually look up why they were called the Dead Rabbits, but um, that was just their name. But yeah, the Dead Rabbits. Rabbits. They didn't like alliteration, I guess. The Bowery Boys? You can't have the Rabid Rabbits and the Bowery Boys. Well, but I mean, you know, dead rabbits. What's a dead rabbit going to do to none? If they're rabid, they can give you rabies. I mean, they could. I mean, wh- or, I mean, they didn't have to Maybe be a- they wanted the dead rabbit to be innocuous and just, I don't know, dead rabbit. I mean, or or the... Did Irish Catholics like rabbits? I don't, I don't, no, I'm just trying to make it make sense. I, it doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, it never will. What is a dead rabbit going to do? I mean, at least make it do something. I mean, you can't be the hoppy rabbits because that's not scary. I mean, they didn't like alliteration, and dead rabbits, I guess, was just what they came up with first. I mean, I don't know. Devious rabbits. Or, you know, I mean, the what? The evil rabbits. The, I mean, you know, like, why dead? The dead rabbits were so named after a dead rabbit was thrown into the center of the room during a gang meeting, prompting some members to treat this as an omen, withdraw, and form an independent gang. Their battle symbol was a dead rabbit on a pike. Well, that's just stupid. Well, you asked. I did. There's your answer. So there you go. Morrissey was also a member of Tammany Hall and a pretty popular boxer as well. And even though the men fell on opposite sides of everything, that wasn't what made them enemies, surprisingly. It's alleged that the tension between... (laughs) That the tension between the men began in 1853. No. Even, Even more trivial than that. Um... When Bill bet on a boxing match, 
and Bill had placed his bet for Yankee Sullivan, who was fighting against Morrissey. The results of the match were disputed heavily. Yankee, Mor- Yankee Sullivan beat Morrissey, but then Sullivan was distracted into leaving the ring by Morrissey's friends, and the referee announced Morrissey the winner for still being in the ring. And Bill was strongly against Morrissey being paid for a win in a match that he didn't win. Well, Bill did get his revenge for this in July of 1854. Morrissey and Bill crossed paths with one another at the city hotel. Morrissey shouted at Bill, quote, You dare not fight me for $100. Name your place and time. Bill set a very much Hamilton Burr set up. I was going to say, yeah. it's kind of like a duel. Oh, just wait. And told Morrissey they were to fight the following morning at the Amos Street docks. At was Don- that in New Jersey? No. Because everything is legal in New it Jersey. Um, at dawn, Bill arrived in his rowboat, just like <laughs> Hamilton and Burr. I would like to imagine that Bill, like, that, that was what he was trying to embody. Uh-huh, like, uh-huh. he knew. Um, gosh. Uh, he arrived in his rowboat where there were hundreds of people waiting to see the fight. Just as people believed that Morrissey wasn't going to show, he arrived at around 6.30 a.m. I mean, he said 7. Why would you think he wasn't going to arrive if it wasn't 7 yet? I mean... Uh, Morrissey sized up Bill and the two circled one another for a few seconds before Morrissey threw a punch with his left fist. But Bill ducked, missing the blow. Bill grabbed Morrissey by the waist and threw him on the ground. Bill was ruthless in his attack, biting, scratching, kicking, and punching Morrissey as he held him down. That's not sanitary. Well, just wait till this. He gouged Morrissey's right eye. Ooh, sorry, guys, this is going to hurt. Until blood started pouring out of it. Ooh. Like, ugh, ugh. Um. I heard it described perfectly the other day on the Morbid podcast where they were talking about something. And, and Elena goes, my whole body just went warm. And I was like, oh, that's the perfect explanation. It just went warm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Gouging someone's eye out until it bleeds. Warm. Like, um, so gross. Uh, One article noted that Morrissey had been beaten so terribly that he couldn't even be recognized by his friends. Morrissey could be heard crying out enough as he crawled away from the fight. Satisfied with his victory, Bill went back to his rowboat and enjoyed a toast with his men. Much like everything we see, there are two stories, and one of those is that Bill's men actually attacked Morrissey, but that can't be proven either. Morrissey went to a hotel on Leonard Street. I like that name. (laughs) To try and bandage his wounds while Bill went to Coney Island to celebrate. I mean, he won the He literally did the World Series. I'm going to Disney World. (laughs) Like, literally going to Disney World. I mean... We're in, we're, guys, we're in World Series season. Just letting you know, things have intensified at my house. The Braves are doing well at the moment, and I have now reached the, the point of my relationship each year where things get intense during baseball season. We, uh... It, you have to plan accordingly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for six months after this, John Morrissey plotted his revenge and on the night of february 24th 1855 morrissey got his chance morrissey was in the back room of stanwick's hall this is actually a place (laughs) not a political party um playing cards with mark mcguire who was king of the newsboys he was not a baseball player no he was not okay um nor was he an actor that played Spider-Man. Um, Toby McGuire. Anyways, <laughs> Morrissey heard Bill's voice and quickly ran up to Bill and began swearing at him. Not kind. Morrissey pulled a pistol and fired three times at Bill's head, but the gun misfired each time. Oh, that is bad. Mm-hmm. 
Bill drew his own revolver, but McGuire intervened, saying to Bill, quote, you wouldn't kill a helpless man in cold blood, would you? Bill threw his <laughs> pistol to the floor and grabbed two knives from the lunch counter. Bill threw them towards McGuire and Morrissey, challenging one of them to a knife fight, but most, both men did not want a knife fight, knowing Bill was too good with knives. I mean, they had seen a display. Yeah. Bill and Morrissey were arrested, but released later that night. Bill returned to Stanwix Hall, allegedly, to apologize to the bartender for the trouble. Just after midnight, a group of Tammany Hall men that included Lou Baker, Jim Turner, and Patrick Paw Dean McLaughlin entered the bar. Bill turned to the men and McLaughlin locked the door. I do have to say a word here, just prefacing that because we typically don't say these types of words. It was a slur. Well, it's a, no, it's a word. Oh. So if you don't want to hear it, just skip forward like two, three, five seconds. I don't care. Uh, so McLaughlin locked the door saying, quote, what are you looking at, you bastard? Mm. McLaughlin grabbed Bill by the shirt, spit in his face, and dared Bill to fight him. Uh, Bill. Spit in his face. Spit in his face. I mean, that you is... You call him that, grab him by his shirt, and spit in his face. Had he had a hat, he would have cut it up and stepped <laughs> on it. <laughs> he had the audacity in one pocket and the and, gall in the other. And a hat to go with it all. <laughs> anyway, Bill took out five Golden Eagle coins and offered to wager Five hundred dollars that he could beat any of them in a fight. Jim Turner pulled out a Colt revolver. Told you it would come back. That he was not looking for a fist fight. No, and he began shooting. <laughs> Jim Turner shot himself first in the arm. Well, that was not smart. Before shooting Bill in the leg. Bill fell on top of Lou Baker after being shot. There was a scuffle, and Baker took out his own revolver and shot Bill directly in the chest, putting a bullet in his heart, saying, Yikes. quote, I guess I will take you anyhow. Baker fired again at Bill and then escaped from the saloon. Bill got back on his feet, grabbed a knife, and began chasing Baker. With a gunshot in his chest. But before he could reach the door, he fell into the arms of his friend, Charlie Shea. He was taken to his home and to the amazement of his doctors, managed to live for two weeks with wow. a bullet in his heart. It was noted that the bill, the, the bill, the bullet was not directly, it wasn't like, it wasn't in and through his heart. It was, you know, there you have the, the four chambers. Peritoneum sac that mm -hmm. surrounds your heart. It had pierced through the sac and was lodged directly near. Like, it was causing damage. Right. But, but it, it wasn't, go. like, in one of the chambers right. or arteries. Like, it didn't hit that. But it was lodged in his heart. Um, so, yikes. Uh, on March 8th of 1855, William Poole, a.k.a. Bill the Butcher, died at the age... Of 33. Wow. 33. Before he died, he said he had not fired a shot that night and that he believed that Morrissey was the cause of the fight altogether. His last words were to the Bowery boys surrounding him saying, quote, Goodbye, boys. I die a true American. Everyone implicated in the murder gave themselves up or were arrested the night that Bill died, except for Lou Baker. Baker fled to Jersey City, where he took passage on the brig called the Isabella Jewett, bound for the Canary Islands. When his destination was learned, a financer in the town named George Law, who might have been friends with the Bowery Boys of some kind, there might have been some kind of like backdoor in cahoots going on there. Um, he placed his clipper yacht at the disposal of the authorities, and Baker was arrested in the port of Tenerife and taken back to New York. Baker was indicted along with John Morrissey, James Turner, Cornelius Lynn, Charles Van Pelt, 
John Hyler, James Irving, and Patrick Paudine McLaughlin for having feloniously killed William Poole with a loaded pistol. The trial lasted 15 days. The jury deliberated for just over a day, but they were unable to reach a verdict. It was reported that nine jurors voted for conviction and three for acquittal. The three for acquittal were allegedly supporters of Tammany Hall. Hmm. Baker was tried twice more, but each time resulted in a hung jury. He eventually was released. After the first trial, a local paper wrote, quote, The trial is especially remarkable as having developed a state of crime and ruffianism in our city that is truly startling. The inefficiency of our present police system, the delays of justice, the frequent escapes from punishment of well-known offenders, as herein manifest, call loudly for reform. Not a reform that will waste and spend itself in mere words, but one for practical results. So even in 1855, they were like, y'all are not doing anything. Like, you say that you're here to protect us, but you're not doing anything. All of these gangs, these mobs, they're all getting away with it. And we would really like reform, but we don't want reform on paper. We want actual reform. And it's just funny that this continues for, like, all the way through Al Capone. Like, yeah. And we haven't even gotten to Al Capone yet. Well, but they're all, it's all tied up. It's politically together. Yeah. It's, there's everybody's it's all, got, yeah, it's all tied up. Everybody's together. got their hand in somebody else's pocket. And um, so it's, it's, very interesting. Uh, Bill the Butcher had one of the largest funerals ever seen in the city of New York City, with thousands of mourners following his casket from Christopher Street to the Battery, where a ferry took the remains to Greenwood Cemetery. It was reported that so many people stood on the roofs of buildings to watch the procession that one house collapsed under the weight of the people, killing four of them. Oh, no. John Morrissey organized groups of men to throw rocks and bricks at the mourners. That's not okay. Yeah. John Morrissey eventually defeated John C. Hennon in an 1858 match to become the undisputed heavyweight champion of America. He retired from boxing six months later. Morrissey went on to open up several Irish pubs and accumulated a fortune of $1.5 million. He later served two terms as a New York State Senator and two more terms in the U.S. House of Representatives. Morrissey died in 1878 and lies buried in a Roman Catholic cemetery in Troy, New York. Now, I told you you might know the name Bill the Butcher, but you may not remember where you know it from, but you should because. Martin Scorsese's 2002 movie, The Gangs of New York, is loosely based on Killing of Bill Butcher chapter from Herbert Asbury's book, The Gangs of New York. Huh. Bill the Butcher is most remembered today thanks to Scorsese's film as well as the performance of Daniel Day Lewis. Lewis's character, Bill the Butcher Cutting, was inspired by the real William Poole. The film is loyal to the spirit of the real Bill the Butcher, but there are some differences. While Bill the Butcher is 47 in the film, his real counterpart died at the age of 33. One of the other main differences is that the real Bill died before the Civil War, while the film version of him is still alive and the leader of the Bowery Boys in 1862. Finally, the last major difference is that the conclusion of the film shows Bill the Butcher dying in a street fight instead of being shot. And, and that, living for two weeks. I know. <laughs> and that is the story of William Poole, Bill the Butcher. Nice. So, yeah, it was, I mean, the, the entire Gangs of New York movie is, is based just off of this, like, one series of of events. I've and never this. seen the movie. I have seen a lot of parts of it, but I've not seen it as a whole. Um, but I did, I was obviously as I was researching this, I was looking a lot into it. Daniel Day Lewis looks a lot like him really? in the movie. And you know how there's some movies that you'll see and you're like, oh, like, nah. yeah, he kind of looks like him. Uh, like Christian Bale, um, in Vice plays Dick Cheney and looks 
identical to Dick Cheney. I it is watch that either. It is astounding how closely they they look alike. They're just huh. some of those movies that you see and you're like, oh, that's the person. Like that is them. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Day Lewis looks very much like Bill the Butcher. So. Always a fun time to be able to visit. I've I, I've discussed this back in our previous episode before. I have been in the mob in my past life. I had to have been. Um, You're just certain. I'm just certain. I, I feel it in my soul. Um, I would have been the one, like in Peaky Blinders, uh, running all the books in the back room, making sure that like the men aren't spending money incorrectly, um, making sure anybody's like. I, w- I would be that one in the back, like making sure, you know, got to make sure everything's up to snuff. Um, but I also, I would have been things. totally oblivious. Yeah, you would have been. I would have yeah. been totally oblivious. I would have just been, been spending like, the money, having the furs, been like, being happy. Yeah, Leah, your husband's, and you're like, no, he's not. He, <laughs> we raise horses. Duh. It, uh, totally. That would have been me. And I'm like, Leah, Leah, yeah. Leah, I, I run the books. <laughs> I would have been oblivious. You'd have been like, I mean, no, no. Leah, his name is Al Capone. I know what his name is. I mean, I get my way all the time because I'm a princess. (laughs) That's why. So, yeah. We, me and my boyfriend were talking about that the other night, about how it's always funny, funny, like in in an ironic way, how these mobsters always end up going down for the complete wrong things. Like Al Capone, it it was tax evasion. It had nothing to do with all the other (laughs) stuff that he did. Like they got him on tax evasion. And so it's always, it's always very interesting to see, see how they do that. So uh, just living back in the world of of New York mobsters again. Um, If, if anybody is listening and has not watched the Netflix special, not Dahmer, uh, Fear City. <laughs> Not Dahmer. Not Dahmer. Uh, Fear City. <clears throat> Fear City is about them taking down the five families. Like the, the cops. Yeah, you take, talked it's about that. It's so good. So good. And one part of it, they're going to this restaurant and they have to bug the restaurant, but they're going at night. Well, the restaurant <laughs> is guarded by a dog. And she's not messing around. And they brought somebody from the CIA and she's like an older dog, but she's a big dog. They brought someone from the CIA that's like, a, like he was going to tranquilize her so that they could do everything. But she was older than he thought. So he didn't want to do it because it he was afraid her. it might. So, so in the documentary, because, you know, they'll like reenact some things. So you see them bugging the restaurant, like, She's in her bed and you see it from her perspective. Mm -hmm. So you're like laying in the dog bed and looking out her eyes and you're watching the CIA like bug the restaurant. It's really funny, but it's a really good um, series. It's not long. It's like four as a series should be. It's Mm -hmm. like four episodes long, but it's it's really good. It's called Fear City. So if you haven't seen it, I suggest watching it. It's very good. And it does talk a lot about how much. The mobs ran New York City, and this was like in this was in like the sixties and seventies. Mm-hmm. Like this is recent, and how what RICO laws are, and just how they were able to take down the mob, and how the CIA and and the FBI like didn't know what RICO was, and the guy who quite literally invented the RICO law mm-hmm. was like y'all have a way to take them down. Let me introduce you to the law that I wrote that has been in, like, here's the exact way that you can take them down. I already wrote it for you, which basically is kind of like the RICO law is. So say, for instance, I ordered you to go put out a hit on someone. It used to be, Just because I said something doesn't mean you had to do it. So you're the only one implicated. Right. But Rico is kind of like from the top down. So it goes all the way back up to the person who ordered whatever it is to be done. And then everybody all the way through the organization. So the guy was like, I literally wrote the law that y'all can take them down. Why have you not used it? And they were like, oh, what's that law again? 
Um, hey, thanks, buddy. Yeah, so it's it's funny. Anyway, it's called Fear City. It's very, very good. I highly recommend it. And if if you are a lover of the podcast, True Crime Obsessed Like I Am, I have a crush on Jillian Pensavalli. Um, It will forever be. She's the one that runs the Hamilcast. She's gorgeous. <laughs> she has purple hair. Like, ugh, in my heart of hearts. Did Love you say perfect or purple? Both. Okay. I'm glad that it came out both ways, but it was only one word. Um, <laughs> so, and her, oh gosh, like her hair is everything I want it to be. Like it's, oh, it's perfect. But they covered Fear City and she is from like Queens. And they always joke with her, like, clear, like that she's a mob princess. Uh-huh. And she's like, I'm not, my family's not in the mob. I'm not saying that I don't know people who could be. And, I don't have, friends. but she has that queens. Like uh-huh. she can bring out her queens, and it's so good. And yes, she's the one that runs the Hamel cast. She has a special place in my heart. I love her. She's friends with Lin Manuel Miranda, Jillian, Jillian, Jillian. It's just me and you talking, Jillian. <laughs> Leave Mike. Leave Mike. I'll move to New York. It's fine. I love Jillian. She is amazing and gorgeous but i love their podcast and they cover fear city and so i don't know if it's on their patreon because i am a patreon subscriber because <laughs> you know why not um <laughs> but they actually have one of the highest grossing patreons period really? like yeah hey speaking of patreons yeah y'all should become our patreon as we well. have one hey jillian would you would you, would you reciprocate would you, please just you know if you would like. Um, so, yeah. But we have a website. Uh, and you can find our Patreon there. It's onenationundercrime.com. You can literally find anything, anything that you need to get in touch with us, to get a hold mm-hmm. of us, to say hello, to, to do anything that your heart may desire. You can join our Patreon. You can just go and, like, give a one-time donation. Like, we have... Mm-hmm. PayPal set up. We have all these different things. So just you are more than welcome to. Um, And go leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It is spooky season. And as I like to say, spread the love during the holiday season. And my (laughs) holiday season is Halloween. So (laughs) we... (laughs) I'm sorry. (sighs) Yeah, spread spread the holiday cheer. And it's Halloween. So Uh, be kind. I have a joke for you. What? Did you know that ghosts don't have butts? They have booties. Jeez. <laughs> right, so. I don't remember. My daughter came and she told me a joke the other day. They, I think they do them like over the intercom at school mm-hmm. some mornings. And she came and she she um had a joke for me. And I don't remember what it was. But it was a Leah joke. My guess was better than what the answer was, and I was real disappointed in her school. I was, I was real disappointed because, and she just looked at me like, "Well, no, but that's a better." (laughs) Okay. Um, She was still happy. Um, I mean, is what it is. So. You can do all those things for us. Go leave us a five yes. star review, five stars only. It is the reason for the season. It is. And if you want, you can request more jokes and I will be happy to oblige. You can find Leah on social media and, and send those requests directly to her. <laughs> um, we appreciate you guys for listening to this week's we episode of One Nation Under Crime. We will see you here, same time. Different crime next week and remember there isn't always liberty and justice for all especially nope. if you run the mob or are in a gang in new york city correct goodbye Bye.